Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Rapcast. This one, a special episode because the Raptors were able to get, you know, big deal, big prospect. Number six on Brendan's board when I was doing my pre-draft conversations and all that kind of stuff. He was my number one. That was the guy I wanted the Raptors to get. I didn't think he'd fall to 13. Here we are with Grady Dick, the newest Raptor, to talk about it with me, Brendan Stewart, who is the... What's what's the term? It's the person who is, you know, the the authority at a place. Our draft <laughs> guru, perhaps, at Raptors Republic, did a whole bunch of draft, like, prospect guides for a bunch of different players. Most importantly, with Grady Dick as well. And so, here we are to talk about him. Brendan, first of all, how the hell are you? Draft season, maybe the work is subsides for a little bit. It's not so crazy now. Yeah, it's... a Nice to be done, at least. I did, uh, I think, probably more pieces this year than I've done before for Raps Republic, which is great to get work done, but also it was, it was actually quite a bit to do. Yeah, no, I'm actually super pleased with the Grady pick. I had him number six, as you mentioned, on my board. The only other player who was reasonably expected to be in that range who I had higher was Casey Wallace. And... You know, there were there were those rumblings that the Raptors were talking with Orlando to move up for, for one of their picks. And I think OKC maybe got wind of that, which is why they traded with Dallas to get number 10, jump ahead of Orlando. That makes sense to me. Um, but yeah, no, overall, super happy with Grady. One of the, I, th- <laughs> I know I, I've, whenever we've done these draft reactions before, I've come across a little pessimistic in the past. Col- Coloco, I was like, eh, it's okay. Scotty, I had a notoriously bad reaction because I was a big Jalen Suggs fan, but he grew on me super quick and I was still high on him. But Grady Dick, probably since OG Ananobi is the first pick where on draft night, I was like, yes, this is the guy. Fantastic pick, fantastic fit, great development. I, I couldn't be more pleased with the with with that pick. Yeah. Hell yeah, I think that's how a lot of people felt. Grady Dick had a lot of buzz. He's also a super popular prospect. He's very accessible for just fans who are seeing the game through social media. He's going to come across your screen more than a lot of other players in the draft. There's guys like, you know, Jairus Walker goes higher up in the draft but that is a guy who you're scrolling tiktok or twitter you're not going to see the fan cams or the like goofy videos or anything like that he's he's very popular and he's very good the elevator pitch if we could get it and actually just before that how much grady did you watch and then sell us on him uh, i probably watched maybe i want to say 10 kansas games uh so decent amount um not as much as i would have liked to um but again had a lot of prospects to cover um a lot of his like finer detail stuff that i wanted to look for i had to find online um but i think yeah i watched a decent amount um so i feel pretty comfortable talking about his strengths and weaknesses at the very least for sure um yeah as for the elevator pitch we're uh you're obviously getting a very talented shooter in my mind the best shooter in the draft i think many scouts would agree with that um, I think the only other player really in conversation for that title is probably Jordan Hawkins from UConn. Um, you're getting, but he's not just a shooter. And I see that label of, you know, oh, he's just a shooter very unfairly put on him by, you know, a lot of people who may not be familiar with his game, which is totally fair. You look at his highlights and that's pretty much all that's on his highlight reel. Uh, but he has a lot of solid secondary skill sets, which I think are quite valuable to him as a player um really big fan of his split second decision making uh as a playmaker in terms of cutting knowing where to be off ball uh i think his defense does need work but i think when he's you know as part of a team defense just kind of creating havoc i think he's quite valuable there he's very good at generating deflections he still averaged about 1.4 steals at kansas which, you know, that's an encouraging number for a guy who's not really seen as a defensive presence. And he's just, yeah, so smart, knows where to be. And I think he's going to be an impact player from day one, maybe not on both ends on, of the floor, but somebody who you feel comfortable putting out there. And based on where he is as a prospect now, you feel like you can 
grow him on both sides of the ball. And maybe you can have a two-way player or a player who's just super impactful offensively and, you know, doesn't get played off the floor on defense, but can still uh, hold his own at the very least. So something you mentioned is these secondary skill sets. If I can just say for the listener, for the viewer, that um, I did mention prior to Grady getting drafted that he was a guy who had multiple workouts with the Raptors. He had multiple workouts with other teams as well. I've heard about some of these workouts from the Raptors and elsewhere in the league. He really, really impressed with his reads against closeouts, making live dribble reads with either hand out to either corner towards the rim. This is something that is one of the most important aspects of the game today. This is something where I make this reference on the podcast a lot, but a guy like Dean Wade, who doesn't have any outstanding skill sets, continues to get rotation minutes on like, I guess, an upper tier Eastern Conference team, because if you continue advantage, you're very healthy for a team. And Grady Dick can do that to go along with elite shooting. And while he only made 52% of his layups at Kansas as a freshman, he's a pretty slight guy right now. He still is a guy who can parlay his shooting gravity into a lot of space to cut and create looks at the rim. He's very good at playing within himself. The physicality is something I think that he will, there will be an adjustment period. He needs to fill out his body. He's somebody who at times can get pushed around trying to initiate through dribble handoffs and like create the right line to play his defender into the screen. All that stuff will come into play. But so far, I think from what I've heard, what I've seen as far as like Kansas games, five. The rest is film looking up the, you know, what's the the site? It's where you go watch the replays, clipping through games and just his play time, all that kind of stuff. Very, very encouraged by his play. He is like a wonderful shooter, especially this is something that Goose brought up as well when we were talking about him is that Jordan Hawkins was a shooter who would be run through the gamut, like a bunch of different actions where the end goal of the play is Jordan Hawkins three. And that's good. And he's a fantastic shooter. But Grady Dick is a guy who, in these broken down plays, is really good at improvising into space as a shooter. And that's really, really important. It's not that he's like, oh, I'm going to come off a pin down here. I'm going to get the pass. The shot goes up. It's like the weak side can break down. I'm going to cut into space. A pass becomes available. Once I get it, then I'm going to pop back out for three. And all this interplay is so important for a guy who, When you first get into the league, you kind of have to find your own usage. They're not going to just hand you everything on a silver platter. So the impact from day one thing, especially offensively, I think you're bang on. Did I miss anything there as far as secondary skills? Do you think there's anything else to address? No, I think like you mentioned with his uh, on closeouts in particular, with his ability to just kind of go into a sidestep or swing it um, like that's one thing that I that stuck out to me in particular when watching his Kansas games is that he had so many moments where, because, you know, defenders were always on him or at least a step away from him just due to his shooting gravity. And on a team like the Raptors, I think that's going to be super valuable because you're going to have guys like Scotty, Pascal, just Jakob in the interior at all times. Grady's going to be out on the perimeter. So just kind of creating that space in general is something that I think him bringing to the Raptors is just going to shift their offense a lot. Um, But yeah, in terms of his, uh, that decision-making you were talking about um, at Kansas, when he would do those side set dribbles or swing it, it was just like so split second. He knew where the ball needed to be. He knew where he needed to be. And it's, it's really encouraging from a complimentary player perspective that you have a player who's, He's not even 20 years old yet coming into the league and knowing these finer details about how the offense needs to be run. And I think that's just the fantastic starting point for him as a player. I really think that there could be something more there um, down the road as an on-ball scorer, but at the very least, this is what you've got. And he's definitely going to be making an impact on day one for sure. You touched on something that the on-ball scoring I've heard that from you. I've heard it from a couple other people. We'll table that for now. That's a really interesting conversation. I want to hear from you because I didn't get as much of that and I want to hear what you're seeing. But just for everybody, we'll give the the bio, the rundown. 
Most people do it at the start of the podcast. We do it 10 minutes in. So Grady Dick, freshman, he's from Wichita, played at Kansas, six foot eight, 205 pounds. The wingspan stuff, it varies what you see online based on the tape and the reports being from he has a six foot eight wingspan all the way to seven feet. I'm going to say he has a marginally positive wingspan. Could be wrong. I'll talk to him in Vegas and ask him if he has the numbers. All Big 12 second team, all Big 12 freshman team. He averaged 14, 5, and 2 on 58% true shooting, 85% from the free throw line, 40% from three, 44% from the field, uh, 49% on his two-point field goals for what it's worth. As Brendan mentioned, some defensive playmaking at 1.4 steals. Okay, the nitty-gritty stuff, three-pointers. 83 of 206 for 40%, of course. 22% of his looks were unassisted. For reference, what that t- type of shot chart looks like, Clay Thompson hasn't had an NBA season with more than 11% unassisted threes. Trent Jr. was at 14% unassisted last year. He was at 24% the year before. So 22%, I'm not as big into the college game. I don't know how big a number that is, but it seems like a meaningful number. 22% is a pretty high percentage. Although, again, I don't know how that kind of scales to college, but at the NBA level, it's massive. Okay, he was 60 for 162 for 37% on his catch-and-shoot threes. 35.6% on the unguarded looks, 38% on the guarded looks. We love guarded shot makers. Okay, he was 23 for 43 on his pull-up triples. That's 53%. That includes not just like, oh, he's in a pick and roll and the defense shoots the gap and he pulls up and cashes it in somebody's face. A lot of these pull-ups are pump fake, put the ball down into space, hit a three. Not exactly the same as far as how a defense responds, but very good as a play finisher. 53% is insane. Um, As I mentioned, at the rim, he shot 59%. Guys dunk the ball. They, I think he was 15 of 18 on his dunks for the year, but he was 52% on his layups. 25% of his shots came there. On the mid-range, sometimes guys, the closeout, that whole, you know, the gambit, you get pushed downhill. He shot 39% on his pull-ups, mostly coming in the long mid-range. Those are the numbers. Welcome to Grady Dick. Brendan, in your dive, did you find anything interesting outside of that? Is there a, a block percentage that you liked? Did the stocks come together for anything like that? Have I missed something? Um, there was. I think you hit most of it. The one uh, – oh, Kansas was 24-2 and two when he scored in double digits. So, you know, that's something interesting. But other than that, I think you hit on most of them. His, uh, his shooting is just stellar. Um, his off the dribble threes, like you mentioned, you know, it's not always, he's not going from hezzies into spin moves into yeah. pull up threes off the pick and roll. But I think it's still such an encouraging number that you have someone who can put it down real quick, bring it back up, still get into a flawless shooting form and cash it in. There's not too many shooting prospects who come into the league who can do stuff like that. And that's where I think that there's, potential to grow there long term if he gets the handle down and we do look at the on ball stuff uh later but the off the dribble stuff for sure is encouraging um at the rim yeah dunks for sure i think he's like decent verticality um can get up to the rim um what else yeah no stellar (laughs) offensive player for sure okay so We'll touch on the team context a little bit. So when you're watching these Kansas games, you see like Wilson as, you know, maybe the play finisher or whatever. It's what do you think about the Raptors makes for Grady to be a good fit? I know you mentioned spacing out for some of their on ball wings. Who knows what happens with the guard spot over these next couple months? We don't know what that's going to look like. Hell, you know, everybody's hearing everything. Fred is gone. He's staying. It Like, it's all just up in the air. It's hubbub. How do you think Grady, how do you think the NBA game will benefit Grady is kind of my question. I think he will benefit for one, having more defensively inclined teammates. And I think that'll help him out on the defensive end of the floor. Offensively, 
I think that again, yeah, he's going to benefit from having interior operators like Pascal, Scotty, Jakob, those guys who can get inside. He'll create, he has gravity. He has teams are going to want to have a guy on him, creates more space. Uh, in terms of like, I'm really, really interested to see a two man game with him and Scotty. I know a lot of people were looking forward to like DHO plays with um, Scotty, Grady on the perimeter, throw one up. Um, Jakob, I think, could be really interesting too. Setting screens, Grady coming off movement because he's so good at those type of shots. And I think he's going to fit in fantastically. Um, I think I'm not too sure how it's going to be coming out. Like if he, if they, if you want a full bench lineup, that could be a different story entirely. Yeah. Cause most of these projections I'm basing off him playing with, you know, the main guys yeah. coming off the bench. Um, I'm not too sure how that's going to go, honestly, cause we got Gary who also provides spacing. You got the main guys coming off of, are going to be precious Boucher, not sure if Flynn's going to crack rotation or not next year. Maybe Banton. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see, I guess. But I th- the, the fit with the bench might be a little more sketchy. So I think ideally you're going to want to run him with some starter bench mix lineups. Uh, because if you run a full bench lineup, there might be some some struggles. Or maybe you just put it in Grady's hands and say, take some shots, man. We need some points. But the, yeah, I would... I yeah. would expect a decent amount of stagnation with the bench. And something that the Raptors are banking on for next season is that, you know, every, I know it's probably overplayed. Actually, it's definitely overplayed that Darko says he wants 0.5 players. You won't find a coach that says they want longer than 0.5 players for what it's worth. But Darko is a guy who has gotten buy-in from stars before to play more, you know, quick paced decision-making basketball most notably Devin Booker. He's gotten it from, you know, some of these quick twitch guards to kind of get downhill a little bit more, make reads, you know, the planned reads out of his pick and roll ethos, his dribble handoff or like pistol ethos, this kind of stuff. Uh, I think that Grady can fit into that stuff pretty well, especially if they start using him, who knows how it looks as a screener. I'd assume pretty terrible in the first couple of years (laughs) because, you know, guys are going to just, you don't even have to stab step around him. You're probably just going to blow him up. Like you go shoulder to shoulder and you bust through it. But as far as playing next to those guys, I think that Grady is somebody who will adjust extremely well. This is something that when Gary opted into his player option, Lewis wrote a really great piece about him and mentioned that the Gary Scotty connection was one of the most fruitful when it came to dribble handoffs, as far as high volume DHO pairings. It was also fruitful, albeit with less volume, in the pick and roll. And this isn't to say that Scotty is the best dribble handoff guy or that Gary is the best two-man ball handler slash interplay guy, but that these skill sets pair quite well together. And Grady, a guy who makes tremendous reads operating in the handoff situations, as far as like baiting defenders to back cut, playing in space, setting his guys up, I know like Maybe maybe he gets pushed around with the you know more physicality at the NBA level, but the the mind is there for that. The feel for the game is there for that. Um, the shooting should get guys out on the perimeter to play in space with him. That kind of stuff is super encouraging, and I think especially considering that it's like six nine and six eight. Well, maybe Scotty's like six ten at this point, six ten and a half. But a couple big guys running those plays, I think, should pair extremely well into the future and just as far as how it impacts og and pascal they aren't the same type of player as scotty they aren't going to be used in those like pseudo four roles if they're being used it's probably not as a dribble handoff hub it's probably as like a a screener in a pick and roll so less two-man game with grady but pascal is probably instead of looking at four guys in the paint he's looking at three because grady actually pulls somebody out that's going to be very meaningful. Uh, Same with OG. Both these guys, they get a lot of, they get feet in the paint. If there's less congestion in there, that is a guarantee of Grady's game. I think that's massive. I think that's a big deal. Something you touched on that I want to go back to, defense. Defense at the NBA level for guys who are like, 
He's 6'8", 205. He, he might get to 210, 212 or something, putting on weight from the offseason. The meal plan started two months ago, I'm sure. You know, he started trying to put on weight, I'm sure. And he's trying to do it responsibly to get bigger while maintaining shooting form, while maintaining agility, all this kind of stuff. He still has to be able to do his backflips on TikTok, oh, everything yeah, like that. Um, defense at the NBA level. What do you think is like a high percentage outcome? And what do you think is like a, a sobering take on what it might look like? Uh, high percentage, you know, I think he can be no, he's never going to touch all defense. Let's get that out of sure, the way. Sure. He's he, I think he can be an above average defender, high end, um, maybe middle of the ground, someone who is, you know, just perfectly fine being a good team defender can defend, you know, kind of average ball handlers in ISO sets, 1v1 situations, hold his own at the very least, advanced kind of creators like, you know, the Kyrie Irvings, the Dame Lillards, the Luka Doncic's of the league. He's probably going to struggle if matched up against those type of guys. I think if um, you look at the, the lower end, and that's where I think a lot of people are concerned, is that he is just flat out terrible defensively. I don't believe that's going to come to pass because as we mentioned, he's pretty smart, at least in the team and help aspect of defense. And he showed that at Kansas, he was pretty uh, good at, you know, blowing up plays, getting deflections, smart in terms of where to be. The struggle is uh, defending one-on-one -on -one and his in general foot speed, lateral quickness, he tended to get blown up and kind of like, you know, it wasn't the fastest kind of crossed over himself a few times. And that's what people are going to look at in terms of his impact as a one-on-one -on -one defender is he's not going to be locking anybody up. Um, and I think that is probably going to be the case for the first couple of years as he gets adjusted to the speed, strength, and skill of the NBA level is he's going to struggle in those one-on-one -on -one sets. But I still think he's going to be valuable at the very least, just providing, he's a good communicator. There was a lot of, um, I don't know, I, I kind of like to call them Fred Van Vliet plays where he will, uh, someone will blow by him and he'll swing his arm around mm. just to poke the ball away. And also there were moments where in the post where a player would have the ball and go to go up and he would bring his arm down to get kind of those, those Fred Van Vliet blocks that should be steals, but are counted as yeah. blocks. Um, he, he has moments like that where you're like, okay, yeah, this guy has value. He can get you extra possessions. He can keep the, the scheme, the play alive and get out running in transition. That's where I think he has value with his communication and stuff like that. Uh, but yeah, the, the struggles are going to be one-on-one. -on -one. I think in general, you're going to want to at least have, you know, one of your better defenders on the floor with him at all times, just to kind of cover for his mistakes. I think having Jakob, as kind of a, a stop piece behind him is a good thing to have because he is going to get blown by. And if you have someone kind of in the interior that is going to help things along, but yeah, the, the defensive concerns are definitely present. I don't believe he's a negative defender. If I have to see one more Kyle Korver comparison, I'm going <laughs> to lose my mind because he is just not your typical coming to the league. All he does is shoot. You know, that's, that's just not the case. He's serviceable on the team defense he's not good on one-on-one -on -one defense but he definitely has the the mind is, the flesh is going to get spongy and bruised but he can improve from there i think the most notable thing when i think about being on the raptors is that presumably yaka pertel is back the raptors have to make it worth his while it's not a it's not a given they have to right. sell him on it they have to pay him but here I am, here I am thinking that, oh, Jakob's going to be back because they, yeah. you know, they traded for him. I'm like, they have to bring him back. And of course, you're right. I, I keep, <laughs> I'm operating under that assumption when I really shouldn't be. Right. And so let's say they do run it back and Grady is a guy who's incubated, insulated. I think that there is potential for him to be protected really nicely in the Raptors scheme in that since he's 6'8", you can hide him on a three or a two. Most teams you play in the NBA, 
you're going to have one of those options at the floor at any given point in time. And a lot of threes and a lot of twos aren't good at screening. And we'll see. Maybe maybe it's Fred Van Vliet at the point of attack. Maybe it's OG Ananobi. Maybe Fred's not there. Who knows? But if it is they're trying to bring him into screening plays, I think that there's enough good point of attack defense to kind of get around that. If they're trying to get those like pinch post actions and isolate on him with a bigger three or something like that, I think that a lot of teams, it's hard to make that type of offense fruitful, especially in the regular season to hunt a guy, especially a bigger guy, every possession, like take time to work it into the post. If they're trying to initiate isolations on him, it's still like, especially in the regular season, like cook his ass offense is not something that is typically tenable or works out that much because it takes so much clock. It relies on such elite shot making that not every single player has. And it's just like, it takes teammates out of the game. Raptors fans will say, Hey, haven't we been running a lot of isolation offense? Yes. Yes, that's true. (laughs) Um, The downfalls will be inherent. You'll understand what I'm saying from there. But Grady is a guy who with his size and his team defense, you should be able to hide him and protect him from a lot of the weaker points of his defense because teams aren't going to just do it every possession. And I think that will give him time to to beef up, to get more used to it, NBA practices, NBA speed. Uh, just based on the cone drill and based on like film I've seen, you're never getting plus foot speed from Grady. Uh, he's a guy who is at best in the future going to learn his limitations and play with a buffer and hope that a decent contest on jumpers, step back, motion into space, whatever, is what he can continue to limit guys to. Try and keep guys away from straight line drives. Depending on how the defense is set up to guard these guys, you can hang a guy as a goalie in the lane to protect him. We've seen teams do that against the Raptors many different times. There should be the infrastructure to protect him somewhat. That doesn't mean he is a star, though. That doesn't mean he's like going to be a good defender from jump. It just means that he'll be able to give you the offensive plus without losing it all back on the defensive end. The thing I want to talk about next, this shot creation. This is interesting because I think this is, I don't, uh, I haven't talked to many people who dislike Grady's game. He's a good player. He has a lot of, in his bag are a lot of the things that are really valued in the modern NBA. Uh, The defense we've talked about, there's negatives there, of course, but shot creation. I, you know, let's uh, give me, give me the pitch. Why is Grady a burgeoning shot creator? So at this point, I think the handle isn't obviously great. I think he is capable in terms of um, just simple, Handling on the perimeter. If he has an open lane, he can handle in uh, decently with either hand. Um, but, you know, he's not going to be cooking up any dribble moves. He's not going to be doing that, any kind of stuff that obviously you need from a shot creator in terms of getting those shots. Where I'm very encouraged, and we touched on this earlier, is with the off the dribble shot making. And I think that is such a projectable skill coming into the league that it's a very good springboard to say, Obviously not immediately. Five years from now, maybe he's somebody who get the ball to him, a couple dribbles inside, quick pull up, dribble around the perimeter screens, throw it up. That's where I'm looking at in terms of his projectable uh, shot making long term. We mentioned his uh, his guarded shot making. What was the? Do you remember the percentage on that on his guarded shots? Thirty eight percent on the catch and shoot looks. On the catch and shoot. So I think because he's he's tall, he can shoot over people. And in the NBA, that's high release. His form is beautiful. Like, honestly, one of the best shooting forms I've ever seen from a prospect coming into the league. And I don't think that's an unfair exaggeration at all. Um, He has the ability to shoot over people. The the off the dribble shot making. Really, I think it just comes down to refining the handle, getting him those kind of reps. And... Like I said, it's it's really just projectable at this point. But I see something there that can 
there, something can definitely come out of that in my mind because he has those skills in place already. With other shooting prospects, you don't really have that when they come into the league. That's, I think, a really good point with creation is that once you start doing something at a high level, defenses will ask always ask you to do something different. Gary Trent Jr., for example, shoots the ball at a really high level. Sometimes he has bad streaks, and then the number at the end of the year doesn't always look elite, but defenses respond to his shooting gravity as if he is elite. That means that he gets pushed downhill. So to start the season when he's shooting 55% on his push shots between like 9 to 14 feet, that's the step that the defense is making him take, and he looks great because he's hitting way more push shots. That's a development of his game. Then teams, they start bringing the defender up a little bit early. That push shot in that area isn't as available. Now it's back to the long mid-ranges. He has to find the next thing. For Grady, obviously he the push shot isn't at the level that Gary Trent Jr. is at. But if, a, if the defense keeps responding to you, eventually one of the decisions you're going to make isn't going to be as a shot maker. It's going to be as a passer, as a playmaker. And that's where I think... You get into the interplay cat and mouse games of like, this is a great shooter. You can initiate and dribble handoff sets. You can run some pet play, pick and roll, second side stuff. You know, depending on how the floor is organized, maybe you have a guy there just in case he can pass out if he doesn't get an advantage. There's going to be all that stuff. But in that closeout stuff, if he gets good enough in the mid range, if he's as deadly as he needs to be from three, He's going to dictate a response from the defense where his playmaking can shine. This was, you know, I mentioned earlier in the workouts, this showed through. This was something in in addition to his, obviously his shooting, his shot prep, the versatility of his shots was something that stood out. This is a super big deal, especially with a team who, you know, you should be making a lot of cuts towards the rim with OG, with Pascal, with Scotty, with Precious. These are all guys who, sure, the you know the Vision 6-9 thing manifested in guys crashing the glass, but what it should manifest in a lot is aggressive cuts to the rim, 45s off of a guy getting the defense to step up, baselines off of teams creeping up to get into the lane, all of this kind of stuff. He should be able to make the live dribble reads. And the more things you can do, it's like the, the skill tree, right? It branches out. You get more options. Grady is a guy who should be able to scale, not necessarily as like a robust creator, but as a guy who can take second side actions and work off of the gravity as a shooting to become more than just a shooter where was the shot open, move off ball, make something happen where he can extend with his dribble, keep looking for plays as a live dribble playmaker. And that is creation. We saw Miami. I mean, it's not as pretty as some guys want it to be. It's not as generic as what we've come to expect creation where it's just like high pick and roll but it's like rapid movement utilize your shooting gravity work into space make progressive reads it doesn't mean you're a star but it is a form of creation that's how i view the grady thing does it extend any further than that for you yeah i mean i think you've kind of nailed it perfectly especially with when it comes to um the passing in particular, we mentioned his really good split second decision making. And I think that's only going to improve just because he knows where the ball needs to be. Um, I don't, I, I want to make it clear that I don't think he's going to become like a Paul George, like uh, amazing first Rats. offense scoring guy. But uh, I think that absolutely. You mentioned that how you come into the league and it's like a skill tree. He has these skills in place already. And then, Throughout the years, he's going to improve on them as defenses force him to react as he develops with the Raptors. Uh, he gets those passing skills that give him the the ability to move off the ball if he doesn't have a shot. But he's also got those other skills that we mentioned too, like the, the off-the-dribble shot making, the movement shooting, stuff that is really valuable in terms of developing those kind of on-ball scorers. And I think that um, down the line, you're going to have a guy who you can – throw the ball in his hands for a few possessions and say, get us something just because of those skills that he has already. And it's, I, th- I think it's pretty easy to see him growing into that kind of role based on how, where he is coming into the league as a shooter and uh, with all those secondary skills that we've touched upon. I think it also makes sense. It's easier to see that future 
you know, we referenced the Miami Heat. A lot of those shooters aren't weaponized if Bam Adebayo isn't there. It's easier to see Grady having this type of creation going forward since he's going to share a massive chunk of his contract time, at the very least, with Scotty Barnes, who he has things he needs to develop in his own game. Scotty obviously has designs on being a creator and kind of a guard adjacent initiator, but still a lot of the best parts of Scotty's game so far have been as, you know, a little bit of a dribble handoff hub, a big who connects with, you know, on ball scorers or big wing, whatever, however you want to frame it. That is exceptionally good for Grady. And as far as those guys pairing together, that makes sense to me. That's something that I love. And, you know, who knows? how that ends up developing, who knows what that looks like. But as far as just from like, there's these skills, there's these skills, that makes sense. It's a platonic ideal as far as pairing those guys together goes. Um, I'm really, really happy with that. The example I want to give is maybe how you mentioned, you know, it's the skill tree, things branch out, scalable skills that work well. Michael Bridges is, I think, a worse inherent playmaker and a worse driver than OG Ananobi, truthfully. But Michael yeah. Bridges has the pull-up now that OG hasn't been able to develop, and that meant that he was on the super highway to generating different defensive responses. So even though he had other skills that were worse in comparison, he gets easier reads as a playmaker, and he can create higher points per possession because teams who wanted to force him downhill, he's a great pull-up shooter. And OG is a guy who hasn't been able to dictate, like teams know how they want to make OG act. You know, if they have defensive help, force him downhill, he's in a crowd that's looking pretty good, it's, especially as an initiator. Grady is a guy who already is the skill set intact if he gets defensive responses. That's, that's mostly the point I wanted to make. But, man... I'm excited. I'm excited about him. Where where were you? Excited. Where were you on draft night? What did that look like for you? We were at <laughs> if anybody's watching, we were at the Raptors Republic live party. Live party, I guess. I don't know what you just a regular party, draft party, and a live party. Um, and so you can watch what that looks like. But Brandon, how how was that for you? I really wish I was there. It looked super fun. I know you guys had a had a Kobe Buffkin chant started at one point. Once he once it started to appear that he was going to be at thirteen, I would have, I probably would have started that if I was there. Um, I was, I mean, yeah, I loved Kobe Buffkin as well. He was number nine on my board, but uh, yeah, I was at work. Um, full disclosure, I work at a golf course. We have a small TV. It's like a thirty-two inch TV at the other end of the shop that I work in. So I was standing there helping some customers. They would leave. I would kind of walk up to the TV until someone else would come in. Um, we get to, uh, where were we? Case and Wallace gets picked. I'm a little bummed out. I really like Case and Wallace. Uh, Orlando's on the board. This is where I thought Grady was going to get picked because one, they had Anthony Black at six, great playmaking guard, big, exceptional defender. I'm like, okay, they're going to go with a shooter for number 11. I'm like, the only shooters that make sense are Hawkins and Grady Dick. And I felt like they were going to go Grady Dick because Hawkins is more of a guard. He's going to take minutes away from guys like Fultz and Suggs. Grady Dick makes more sense because he can play on the wing. He can play beside uh, Wagner or Paolo. And the fit in general just made more sense to me. They pick a Michigan guard and not the Michigan guard I was expecting. They took the worst of the two Michigan guards. So I was like, stunned when I heard Jet Howard's name. So I was like, okay, uh, this means that one of Buffkin or Grady is for sure going to be at 13, if not both, because Dallas was now picking at 12 and they had been linked to Derek Lively the second yeah. pretty much since the draft cycle started. So I was like, okay, we have a real shot here and go back. Derek Lively comes off the board. I'm, I'm live tweeting this whole thing. I'm like, Grady and Buffkin are both on the board. This isn't a drill. Um, I, I'm getting that out there. These two guys were, I was hoping. Uh, I'm wa watching the TV. Uh, some lady comes in beside me and is, is 
kind of looking at stuff on, on the shelf that we have there. And Adam Silver says, Grady Dick. I do one of these. I clap and I do like a fist pump right beside this lady's head. I didn't even realize that she was there. I felt so bad. But I was like, oh, I'm so sorry. And she's like, no, it's okay. She's like, what are you watching? And I'm like, oh, the NBA draft. And she's like, oh, like she, she didn't care at all. But, uh, but yeah, no, I was, as soon as we got Grady Dick, I was like, man, yes, that's what they needed. He's such a good player. I love them the pre-draft cycle. I know a lot of other scouts who love them as well. You've talked with a bunch of scouts who love them. And I like, I, again, this is <laughs> one of the first prospects that the Raptors have picked on draft night that I've been super stoked about initially from the get-go. So yeah, really, really excited with the way that went down. Can't wait to see him. Super excited to see how the two-man game with Scotty develops. Super excited in general. That's, yeah, that's great. I, I didn't talk to a scout who didn't like him. I think Ben Pfeiffer. Now, I talked to a bunch of scouts who I didn't end up bringing on the podcast. Just Grady had great buzz, man. People, you know, that's you're a shooter who is really good at utilizing your own gravity. It seems like you give a shit on defense and offense at, you know, making use of your off-ball self scouts will like you um coaches will probably rave about you as well at summer league uh hopefully i'll get a decent amount of time with grady to talk about his game some of the reads he makes on the floor that will be for the listener the viewer some of the written stuff that's forthcoming i think i'll have like a bit of a deep dive on grady coming forward but i'll tell you this much that's going to be paywalled uh, the person who did a big deep dive on Grady that isn't paywalled, Brendan. It's on the website right now. I suggest you go read it. It's paired with another prospect, of course, but just read the Grady part and maybe learn about another guy if you're interested. But I can't recommend that enough uh, as far as Raptors Republic representation of Grady's analysis of Grady's game. I think we've done a really good job. There's like, once this podcast comes out, it's got to be like two hours, maybe two hours and 15 minutes of just Actually, we'll wait like four hours at this point in time because we did the live podcast too. I don't know. And then obviously Brendan's great piece. I'll see if I can get some interesting quotes, some interesting stuff about him at Summer League. But basically, listener, viewer, just be excited. The Raptors drafted, in my opinion, a very good prospect. Brendan, any thoughts on Grady before we get out of here? Hey, man, if nothing else, they drafted a very badly needed uh, shot of personality. And I think that having a real character like that is going to be, you know, we all want vibes, right? And he's, he's going to bring back the vibes for sure. I think he's going to be hilarious on social media. I think he's, he's a great interview from what I've seen, even at Kansas. Did you so see the Donald you, Duck? The I Donald... saw the, I saw the Donald Duck. I, I sent that to my parents and they were like, what is, <laughs> they were a little more confused than I was. I thought it was yeah. hilarious. My parents were like, why is he doing Donald Duck? But yeah, no, he's such a character. He's such a good teammate and locker room guy, such a good interview. He's funny. He's well-spoken. I think that he's very quickly going to endear himself to many Raptors fans. And I think he, in general, he's going to bring back some vibes that were sorely missed from from last season uh i've had to sit down with coloco i've talked to him a fair bit he's pretty earnest uh but i've also had a decent amount of time with precious og scotty those guys are inscrutable and irreverent and funny all three of them and grady added to that the raptors young core is they are a goofy bunch uh and a lot of easy laughers in that group um even even if OG doesn't come off like it, he's always, you know, doing the bit. But there's there's a lot of goofballs there. Hopefully the goofball era of the Raptors is one that also leads to wins, beautiful basketball. Darko is maybe in, you know, in the goofball uh, hierarchy as well, somewhere in there. Brendan, thank you so much for joining me, illuminating myself and the listener and viewer on Grady Dick. Listener, viewer, thanks for joining us. It's been an absolute blast. Whether you got into this in the morning or at night. Have a blessed day and goodbye.